The election of 1880 between James A. Garfield with his running mate, uh, Chester A. Arthur, the, the, the main person of this particular episode, going against the Democrat Winfield Scott Hancock with his running mate, William H. English. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I briefly touched upon this uh, when I was talking about James A. Garfield's presidential run in this particular election. I don't really need to go that in-depth um, upon it for the most part but ultimately a lot of things were happening the culmination of a whole bunch of different practices and a whole bunch of different people rising up the greenback party being present in this particular election and a whole bunch of different things that really occurred um loyalties between north and the south tariffs uh chinese immigration was becoming a bit of a problem around this particular time too but i'll get to that when i talk about chester A. arthur and his term as president but ultimately with the Republican Party united, Democrats kind of going back and forth and not really solidifying under one particular, uh, I don't even want to say ideology, um, but you know, you have Northern Democrats that have a particularly different perspective and then Southern Democrats who have a very different perspective as well, um, ultimately uniting un- against just anti-corruption um, in many instances, although Democrats themselves are just corrupted just in a very different way and you know it's just one of those things where it's like the other party's like oh these guys are corrupt etc etc and yada 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 and then the other party even though when they get in they're they become even more corrupt and the government just becomes a, a an entire you know mess entirely this is no different um chester a arthur's role though ultimately when he was being picked ultimately as the vice president as the compromise between conkling and you know to unite the republican party ultimately between the two factions uh, the half breeds and stalwarts chester a arthur was uh, once he was nominated and once it was very clear he was going to, to be p- potentially the vice president he went full bore he was just basically like fam i'm gonna do this the right way and represent my my people my party he would go on speaking tours and actively campaigned in which case you can I, un- ironically, unfortunately, I make uh, the assessment that, you know, he was technically like the first real modern politician in that sense. Ultimately, since he's going to be president, but he was the one that was on the campaign trail for James A. Garfield, along with Grant, Conkling, and a whole mess of other individuals and people that would lead to him uh, becoming kind of like the eyes and, and, and ears of, you know, Garfield in a lot of ways. Uh, James G. Blaine, their relationship really blossomed during this particular time, which is a big reason why. Uh, when he achieves political office and they win the election, that um, ultimately Chester A. Arthur will branch off against and go against ultimately um, uh, Conkling himself. But he's campaigning, he's going through a whole bunch of different things. Um, it's also very clear, too, there might have been corruption, obviously, that had actually occurred. I'm not going to be surprised by that. Maybe Arthur buying some votes. Who knows? Um, a lot of things are not fully corroborated, not fully proven. There's one story in particular in Indiana where there might have been some shenanigans going on uh, that might have actually helped them win the election specifically. Remember, and, and, and at the time, Indiana's got 15 electoral votes. So, you know, if it's going to be a tight election, it could be the difference between winning and losing the election. But ultimately, the final results being that James A. Garfield would defeat Winfield Scott Hancock. Electoral votes between 214 to 155. Garfield would carry 19 states. Han- Hancock himself would carry 19 states. And Garfield himself would barely win the popular vote. But ultimately, James A. Garfield would be the country's 20th president. And Chester A. Arthur, his vice president. Now, as vice president, like I just mentioned very briefly earlier, that um, once he's in, once Blaine starts really taking hold of the cabinet in a lot of ways, and Garfield is adamantly against Conkling in many aspects and in many ways. Chester A. Arthur, wanting to be on the president's good side, ultimately decides with James A. Garfield and Blaine, um, effectively cutting himself off from Conkling in many ways. And excuse me, and ultimately kind of just backstabbing Conkling. But at the same time, Conkling. You know, he's not the best person either, so you know how it goes. It's politics, baby. Um, but ultimately, you know, when you're the vice president, you're basically the tie-breaking vote in the Senate, and especially considering at that time, I think Con- I think there's, what, 37 states, um, ultimately, and the entire country was split in half. I think there was 37 Republicans, Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Senate was really split, so Garfield would basically have... Uh, really a, a lot of power hypothetically with a tie-breaking vote ultimately i think it's going to be very interesting 
had Garfield lived, how he would have legislated in that particular fashion and in that particular way. Um, but Garfield was the vice president for like a couple months, really didn't do much. He was just there to help execute the cabinet appointments along with Garfield, helping to adjudicate the process. Um, didn't really go well because Conkling, um, like I briefly, briefly talked about with uh, Garfield's presidency, um, stopped a lot of it, really put forward a real roadblock ultimately in trying to, to do all those things that, you know, you're supposed to be doing, you know. And things just became difficult because of that. And then tragedy strikes and Garfield gets shot. And it creates a lot of problems and a real big conundrum ultimately during after the first three months. Because at that point, you know, the presidential succession line has been very clear and very much um, um, solidified at that point. The vice president will take over. But Garfield hasn't died yet. He's been shot. And Chester E. Arthur, for the three months that... Garfield's basically laboring near death, um, didn't do anything. So in a lot of ways, the country didn't have a president for the better part of three months. Um, and, our, and for Arthur, based off of some biographies, based off of what I believe his reaction was, was shock, fear. Um, you know, it's kind of just like the kind of person who's, oh crap, oh crap, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? That's kind of how I view Arthur in many aspects. He's just someone that... Once that actually happened, and that became a particular reality, uh, it shook him, for better or worse. It's probably the only way I could really explain it. And like I said in the very opening, you know, he really held up into his house for quite some time because of this particular and potential fear of him actually becoming president, um, in which I don't really blame him. But ultimately, after some time, and after a lot of reservations, Chester A. Arthur had no other choice. Once Garfield passes away and he pays his respects, Chester E. Arthur will be sworn in as his country's 21st president of the United States of America. He would take his oath of office in Washington, D.C. I think he would arrive there days after uh, after Garfield died, and he would take it uh, before the Chief Justice, who at the time was uh, this guy, Morse, uh, Waite, or Watt, W-A-I-T-E, and basically would just shed tears of fear, excitement, and just an uncomfortable future that might lay ahead for Chester A. Arthur. Chester A. Arthur is now our 21st president of the United States of America. Chester A. Arthur's cabinet was basically, he just brought in for the most part uh, Garfield's cabinet. Um, they immediately went into blows and into conflict, especially with James G. Blaine and a whole bunch of other people for the most part. And in fact, aside from his Secretary of War, which is Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, every single person within that cabinet would effectively resign by the end of the year uh, for the most part. Um, I believe the last one being the Secretary of the Interior, Kirkwood. I'm not sure. It might have been him or the, or, the, or the Secretary of Navy, William Hunt. But for the most part, he would have to replace every single appointment that he had within his cabinet. And I believe he's one of the very few presidents that actually never had a vice president, um, which is astonishing to me, uh, to be honest with you. Um, there was no successor, ultimately, so that would create a whole bunch of different problems. So it's a good thing that Chester Arthur did not perish in any way, shape, and form. Um, some of the people that he brought in, Folger, Gresham as the Secretary of the Treasury, his new Secretary of State would be Frederick Theodore, Freyla, I said, uh, I'm terrible with these names. Um, it was always just a revolving door, ultimately. He would always have different problems due to the initial political climate that really occurred during this particular time. Um, the president really didn't have as much power since the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln was the president. So for a lot of these guys, it was always just a political battle and political machinations um, and a trial and tribulations, ultimately, that would lead to a dysfunctional, stagnant, centralized government um, that the country had during that particular point in time. So I think it's really interesting just to point little things out. Because I always point out, and I probably briefly talked about this earlier, was that you know the the country, at the very least, or at least the federal government, was probably at its weakest, relatively speaking, during this particular point in time, post uh, Civil War, post Reconstruction. So basically, once Grant leaves office, for relatively speaking, twenty plus years, the federal government's relatively pretty weak. Um, and I don't want to say relatively weak. They saw a lot of power. They saw a lot of influence. They could really do a lot of things but in terms of the main reason why they did it was because the checks and balances relatively speaking kind of worked 
the South really stopped and stagnated a lot of different things. And in particular, I would probably say them not wanting to look or, and appear as corrupt as they were. Um, a lot of presidents really held back on legislating in a lot of different ways that ultimately would lead to a lot of different issues. Uh, that's just my two cents. During his term as president, um, Arthur would have two vacancies to fill. He would replace the first one um, very early uh, in his in his term was uh, Justice Nathan Clifford. He was a Democrat, um, had been there pre-Civil War, um, and ultimately replaced him with a guy named Horace Gray, who would effectively be there for the next 20 years, uh, adjudicating and legislating, or not legislating, but you know what I mean, he'd be there for the next 20 years, uh, influencing the country. And then, on top of that, another vacancy occurred, uh, Ward Hunt, um, he retired later in, in, later midway through, I think, 1882, during Chester A. Arthur's presidency, which is interesting, because there's a whole bunch of different things that came up about it, um, for political machinations, and also just for sheer, uh, let's just say, uh, I guess I kind of owe you one kind of thing. Uh, Roscoe Conkling himself actually uh, was initially given the nomination, but ultimately declined because, you know, hurt feelings, boo-boos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he would eventually nominate this guy, Samuel Blatchert, Blatford, uh, sorry, Blatford, Blatchford. God, I'm terrible with these names. Uh, but he would serve until 1893. Sorry about the helicopter in the background. I will wait to record until the helicopter leaves. What is the country like when Chester A. Arthur takes the presidency? You know, the, uh, it's, it's presidencies like Chester A. Arthur's and numerous other presidents when you really look back and understand your history, or at the very least have a conception of history, and really look at everything. Um, it's, it's, it's surprising if we've ever had a functioning nation to begin with. Um, Chester A. Arthur comes in 1880, 1881, basically during a very tumultuous time, like always, uh, in this country's history, there's a bunch of different things and a bunch of different machinations that are going on. You know, the, the federal government is at its lowest point, ultimately. Uh, reasons being corruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Hayes didn't really do much to alleviate that in any meaningful way. Pretty much half the country hates the federal government. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of distrust and potential for a second civil war, little things like that, especially with a lot of the, the southern Democrats. I guess you could say the, the more conservative, more white, I guess. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, they, they kind of re retook a lot of power in the south, and this is like the beginning of, like, the Jim and Crow south in a lot of ways um, that's coming up. Um, a lot of things are happening. There's a lot of distrust in the government. Indian wars are still raging on. Uh, basically in the West, in the Midwest, you know, Custer's Last Stand, all that stuff. It's still kind of occurring throughout the entire country, so there's a lot of problems with that. You know, civil rights is still a big issue, too. Uh, surprisingly, in the North as well. Yeah, they might be free, but, you know, they're not free in a lot of ways. Um, and the Republicans are, in a lot of ways, abandoning a lot of the a lot of black people, unfortunately, although they'll still vote Republican, which is a big reason why a lot of the Republicans ultimately win in a lot of these elections. Um, and then foreign policy-wise, it's ever so more complicated. Excuse me. You know, there's a lot of tensions uh, that really won't occur until later, I would say, in Gar Grover Cleveland's second term as the president, when, like, you know, the Spanish still have control of Cuba. There's a lot of things going on there. Um, and at least foreign policy-wise, tariffs, 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 and economics, some, some relative economic stagnation. You know, there's an interesting book that I... I there's a couple interesting books by... Um, the really great historian William Appleton Williams that I've been reading, and you know uh, he really looks at history in, in the context of economics, um, and when he puts it in the in the perspective that he's putting it, it makes things fascinating. Uh, to be quite honest with you, and you know his arguments are really sound and poignant, and I don't know how to disparage any of them. To be quite honest, but he, he just makes a point that you know a lot of foreign policy, a lot of how our markets and how our country ultimately is uh, at this particular point was very laissez-faire and ultimately screwed over a lot of different people. And while we achieved incredible levels of technological, financial advancement, you, know, we went, we, you have to remember, we went from being like a backwater country, um, a backwater small republic in like 1812 that stood up to Britain and ultimately within 
two generations effectively uh, was one of the leading economic powers in the world even by like we were outpacing britain you know and they were the leaders of the industrial revolution in many aspects in many ways so you know a lot of things were changing and it's the changing of the guard the guard in a lot of different ways ideologically and politically speaking the economy was changing in a lot of ways and it started going away from you know things that we need raw materials etc cetera, etc cetera, to being like you know guys like henry ford are going to be born around this time and they're going to start creating these things uh, and items and luxuries ultimately that are going to be a big part of economic growth that we're going to really be basing our economies on and you know it's interesting to really point it, like to put it and to poignantly look at it and tariffs were still a big issue especially in the south when you know there's there's no slavery but there's still a bit of a, 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 like a bit of an agrarian society along with some relative levels of industrialization that is, that, is, that are going on this country and will forever be ever since the civil war ever since the, the entire country's inception is going to be very divided and chester a arthur is going to be taking over for James A. Garfield, who was supposed to come in and do the civil service reform and be forced to really take hold a lot of the things that Garfield represented and what he was supposed to bring and what he is meant to bring. So for Chester A. Arthur, in 1880, he's coming into the, his first and only term as president in a very, very tricky point in this country's history. For Chester A. Arthur, I'm going to, and probably for a couple other presidents, it really depends on, on who for the most part, um, I'm probably not going to use the timeline as much, ultimately. It's not as necessary for, for Arthur, uh, ultimately, um, in many aspects, in many ways, because for certain presidents, it's very clear to, you can very clearly just look at their entire presidencies, how everything went for them through specific key issues and key things um that were occurring during this particular point in time and for arthur it's very clear i would probably say five maybe six things that were really occurring around this particular era um that are pertinent to his presidency and that really encapsulate all four years uh, overall uh, you know unlike certain other presidents where it's it's very strict that you should follow a timeline in order for things to, to be very clear as a lot of those issues with other presidents tend to be cascading effects where one thing affects another and affects another and affects another and for for arthur it's a little bit different uh to put it so for arthur i would probably start off with the the first couple of things at least uh in terms of domestic policy for sure civil service reform reducing tariffs chinese immigration Renovating the White House is actually one thing that should always be pointed out, too, because, um, excuse me, um, Arthur himself was someone who really enjoyed the exquisite tastes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and ultimately, along with his wife, Ella ended up uh, really, uh, I guess you could say, remodeling the White House. I think they, at, the, at that time, spent about $30,000, which would be $2 million in today's money. All taxes, by the way. I just want to point that out, which is great. <laughs> uh, and just renovating the White House and with lavishness, et cetera, et cetera, you know, classism, am I right? But ultimately, at the very least, in terms of, you know, the, the things that he was trying to do was naval reform. He tried to really fix the South, uh, Native American policy, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of different things that he was trying to do. So we should probably start off with civil service reform. Civil service reform was something that the Democrats really wanted, the country really wanted in a lot of different ways, shape, and form, but ultimately never really materialized because Congress was very stubborn, uh, really corrupt during, I guess you could say, Grant's presidency, and really during Hayes' presidency, too. I didn't really touch on it that much, but it was always really stagnant, and although, you know, it, it sucks because Hayes ultimately was just more of a facade kind of president in the sense that he really didn't do anything and ultimately some of the things that really did occur were just more for show like getting chester a arthur out of uh, the customs house and you know it's like ah, oh, i did this ha huzzah but it really it, it really wasn't much more than that to be quite honest and you know the, the country was really getting fed up um arthur very early in his presidency wanted some relative civil service reform but he wasn't going to bend at the will of everyone he was going to do it his own way which i i admire in some aspects where it's basically like if we're going to do it we're going to do it my way and it's going to be the way that's going to be good etc cetera, etc cetera, instead of doing the will of the people but you know it, 
Arthur came into the presidency wanting to be very different. He wasn't going to be held down and really, you know, for the most part, uh, persuaded by other groups and different people, which is a big reason why, you know, a lot of his cabinet members would ultimately leave, Blaine, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not, I'm not saying that he was like a good person or that he was going to legislate and uh, lead the country in a very uncorrupt way uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but at the very least, it seems like he was focused, he was ready, and I think in some way, shape, and form, um, he, he was, because of what, the basically just because of the direction of the country, basically because the people ultimately wanted it, he was forced to, one way or another, really improve the country through civil service reform, at the very least, do something. Other, other, it was either that or the country was just going to go up in flames because of disagreements. So the initial, initially speaking, there was a couple of different uh, pieces that would always that would come out of Congress ultimately f- in order to that were basically for civil service reform in some way, shape, and form. The only piece that really went through but didn't really go anywhere in the in the initial going would be known today as the Pendleton Act. Um, effectively, the Pendleton Act just stopped in many ways, shape, and form. Uh, salary kickbacks, appropriations, uh, federal appointments along the states, and basically, in order to stop corruption, forced government employees to start at the very bottom of the, I guess you could say, the, the bottom of the totem pole and work their way up. It basically just streamlined the government in many aspects, just to hey, you're not going to take any bribes, et cetera, et cetera, any bribe, whatever, even if it could be politically biased, uh, we're not going to accept, and then it's going to take you down the totem pole, and that if you're going to reach your particular spot on that totem pole, you have to start from the very bottom and work your way up. So it's basically just like, you know, a business in a lot of ways. We have to rise up uh, from the very bottom before you actually get to the very tippy top. And Arthur himself was very, I guess... Uh, I don't even want to say he was skeptical specifically about this bill, but he's like, eh, give me, give me something else, preferably one by a Republican, you know, because uh, um, the guy who wrote it was this guy, George Pendleton. He was a Democrat from, it was Demo- he was a senator from Ohio as a Democrat. And, you know, for a couple years, there was a lot of stagnation. Arthur had a whole bunch of different things going on, unfortunately, by this particular point in time. But um, unfortunately for Arthur, things would kind of just go down the drain um by 1882 during the midterm elections the democrats would just take over the house and it was abundantly clear that the majority or the relative majority that they enjoyed uh was basically just not there for arthur and the democrats had a lot more power and a lot of strength so arthur unfortunately for him to try and lead the country was going to be cajoled um because of the lack of power ultimately that he had within the executive branch so By 1882, he's like, okay, I'll look at the Pendleton Act. We can work something out. I want to get this done, and I want to get it done the right way. So in order for uh, the actual Pendleton Act to actually go through, um, it required a bipartisan five-member examination board to look at basically everything that was within the federal government itself, Um, which I want to point out is very interesting um, that Arthur really quickly established the five-member board and really went through all the investigations. So they went through an investigation of the entire federal government, saw a whole bunch of different things that they didn't like, and ultimately after a lot of pushing and a lot of things, (laughs) I guess you could say, and a lot of bribery, you know how it goes with the federal government, um, ultimately the, the act would pass and the Pendleton Act would be the initial service, civil service reform that at least Chester Arthur can hold his, his uh, head up high. It did a lot of different things. More so, um, really changed... Pen- the Pendleton Act is one of those things that the more you look into it, it's really interesting. Because it also changed the way uh, campaigns, apparently, were supposed to be financed, too. But back then, uh, businesses would, you know, and corporations, or the equivalent would be a corporation back then, would really help finance a business, et cetera, et cetera. Now they couldn't do that because they didn't want to be in the pocketbooks of, you know, big business people. So ultimately, it had to be privately funded or personally funded by, you know, people, the people. Although that changed uh, to effectively become um, rich people and rich donors, ultimately, that would help finance campaigns and a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, I guess you could say elections, et cetera, et cetera.
nothing really changes because of that. It just changes the way things ultimately operated in that fashion. Let's talk about tariffs. Um, tariffs are, you know, export and import taxes ultimately. And, you know, like I said before, things really aren't that different from even to today's standards. It's not really that different ultimately. Um, but tariffs, ultimately, depending on where you're at, were going to be good or bad, depending on how high or low the actual tariffs were. You have to understand that, you know, despite the economy changing in the South, ultimately, they still benefited, ultimately, from, from low tariffs. The North was basically high tariffs, and we can actually protect wages, et cetera, et cetera, and ensure certain growth in certain industries. Um, it's still an ideological battle, uh, ultimately, between the tariffs and between, you know, the ide- ideological perspectives of the Northerners and the Southerners. And I think it's really interesting, too, that, you know, for the first time in this country's uh, history for, for, or not not the first time, let me, let me, let me restate that. Um, one of the very few times in this country's history the, the entire government actually had a surplus of money. Yes, the, the government actually collected more than it spent around this particular point in time, which I gotta be quite honest with you, um, we will never see that probably in our entire lifetimes, which is unfortunate. Um, but the the United States government ultimately did have a, a specific surplus, and this created really a two-pronged issue in many instances, in many ways, uh, for Chester A. Arthur and the Republicans and Democrats and just the country as a whole. The first issue was, you know, you have a surplus. What are you going to do with that surplus? The surplus being, it depends on your numbers. Um, at, the, at that time, it was about like $150 million in surplus just from, you know, the, the country having such a really good, relatively speaking, um, exporting and importing economy. And ultimately, um, I think it'd be probably close to like, I don't know, like 100 to 200 billion dollars in today's money like the surplus uh you know considered for inflation obviously um you know there was real economic opportunities in which the which the country could go into um it's really interesting a lot of people wanted to invest in internal improvements more road better roads um maybe even some technological advances, conservation, and then, you know, there's a whole bunch of big business people that are like, build more railroads, et cetera, et cetera, build more canals, yada, yada, and do a whole bunch of different things. And then the other main issue is that, which goes along with what I was just talking about earlier, the tariff. You know, do you improve it? Do you lessen it? What do you do about taxes, you know, in just in general? Now, Arthur was uh, uh, more so, but he didn't specifically choose any one particular side (coughs) Um, in terms of the tax issue. He would probably be much more inclined to be with the Republicans who advocated for generally high tariffs to protect American jobs ultimately and et cetera, et cetera, um, and produce more homebound. Although the Republicans themselves would really change their tune um, over time, especially with the growing uh, problems that would occur during, I guess you could say, the Progressive Era, and you know, in the early twentieth century, um, it's gonna it's gonna be very interesting, or it was very interesting, uh, Arthur's perspective in a lot of ways. Um, more often than not, he actually kind of sided with the Democrats in many issues and in, in many respects. Uh, partly because, uh, well, it's it's two reasons. Ultimately, um. The Republicans were not really super friends with Arthur at this particular point. And, you know, if he didn't do what the Democrats wanted in many ways, which the country ultimately wanted in a lot of ways, uh, the Republicans would lose a lot of elections, which they did um, in the midterm elections of 1882. They'd lose the House and a whole bunch of different seats. And it would just make things more difficult for Arthur to get things done. Arthur's not a dummy. He He understood overall the long-term goals the political machinations he was not very short-sighted surprisingly and showed a unique candidness about it when he in terms of his uh legislation for the most part so what was arthur to do well he did a bunch of different things he ultimately ended up uh, especially during the midterm elections when they lost but before that um he really thought about it long and hard ultimately of what he wanted to do he wanted to cut taxes cut the income tax and really just cut taxes across the board except for i think whiskey and just alcoholic spirits etc cetera, etc cetera. um and let people kind of just do what they want which mad props to the guy but congress felt a little bit differently um he, he appointed a special commission um 
basically saying that uh, you know to improve the tariffs, it should be up to about twenty to twenty five percent, or twenty to twenty five percent reduction across the board. Which everyone's like, oh my god, you know. And it's it's really fascinating. Uh, he would actually veto uh, one of the bills that would eventually pass. It would be known. Um, uh, as the mongrel tariff of 1883, which would pass. So based on the mongrel tariff, dropped rates on a whole bunch of different items by about 1.5%, um, which was, at the time, uh, depending on the particular item, there were, well, a couple books called this the scientific tariff, um, which is interesting, especially for the Republican Party to really accept it, and Arthur to accept it instead of vetoing it. He signed it and accepted it. Um, it was really interesting, <laughs> to, to put it... To put it uh, into perspective, a lot of Republicans did not like that, um, that he signed it in ultimately because uh, it hurt Eastern uh, political machines, Eastern manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera, and Northern manufacturers and made things a little bit difficult, um, excuse me, um, for the country ultimately, which is interesting. Um, the Republicans were not happy with, Ar- with Chester A. Arthur, especially by uh, 1883. I'll get to that near the end uh, of his presidency when I when I get to that point. Really, for the first time, um, I think that I've probably talked about in this entire series, immigration's a real problem uh, in the country by 1880. Uh, to be quite honest, immigration's always been a problem, um, really within this country. The Irish coming over, French, other European, <coughs> excuse me, European countries coming over. Um, especially some some immigrants from Hispanic nations, the Spanish nations, um, but Asian nations especially too. Um, the country had to deal with immigration. You know, America's the idea of the American dream, laissez-faire, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, there's it, it, it's a very complicated issue and subject that a lot of people, especially today in today's political climate, always like to make a big deal and point out in terms of the whole Anglo-Saxon white people. Um, having monopoly on a whole bunch of different things in this country. And, it, yeah, that's 100% true. So, you know, th- it is an unfortunate reality that, you know, th- this country was really run by those people. But at the very same end of the spectrum, you know, it's... yeah, yeah You're not going to see it in the reverse, to be quite honest with you. You know, no one wants to bring up the point of, you know, what if white people come to, like, Japan, for instance, and try to... I mean, even today, you know, if, if a white person goes to Japan... You know, the truth is, is they're probably going to be treated, relatively speaking, as a second-class citizen. You know, they won't be, you know, disparaged by any way, shape, and form. But, you know, Japanese people will probably choose Japanese people, or Chinese people will choose Chinese people. It is what it is. You know, it's just how things go. You know, and I think America today is pretty pretty progressive in a lot of ways. I mean, we are the idea of liberalism, for better or worse, you know. I'm, I'm, losing, my, I'm losing my train of thought on my point. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is immigration is a real issue. Um, a lot of immigrants are taking a lot of hard-working jobs. The country has, I guess, uh, a really poor middle class. A lot more people are taken out of, um, you know, the, the, the heap, I guess you could say, especially in real natural-born Americans. Uh, but it's really difficult for immigrants, and specifically, you know, really poor immigrants who come from this country. And a lot of, you know, specifically different ethnic origins are going to have a lot of issues and a lot of problems. One particular issue involves the Chinese, who who really first came over during the gold rush, and were you know they're trying to mine gold, get rich there, built a lot of railroads there, and things were very very tedious and difficult, especially out west when all that and all the shenanigans are happening. That being said, I mean it's it's very apparent and very clear that immigration, specifically Chinese immigration, um, was a real problem ultimately, and. What makes it interesting is that this is, in some ways, a bipartisan uh, agreement to a certain extent between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Republicans were much more, um, uh, much more sympathetic. <coughs> excuse me to the <coughs> Asian American immigrants ultimately, but they, even they were basically, along with the entire nation, to be honest, like, yeah, uh, could you like stop coming over here? And can we, like, you know, build railroads and stop taking jobs away from the white man? You know, numbers vary, but ultimately, you know, a, a Chinese immigrant would probably work uh, probably for a sixth of what a white uh, American would work for, which that's going to create a lot of problems. <coughs> Excuse me. And, 
it became very abundantly clear that it wasn't going to be going away anytime soon. So Congress uh, begins in 1882 uh, to propose the Chinese Exclusion Act. And there's a whole bunch of different machinations that go along with it. But bottom line, it restricts aggressively so. It doesn't completely stop. It grossly restricts Chinese immigration um, for the better part of 20 years. (coughs) 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 Sorry, I have a really dry throat. Um, For about 20 years. Now, this creates a whole slew of different issues, for better or worse. A lot of the economy was really built on the backs of Chinese people, and specifically Chinese immigrants, um, especially with the labors of the tra- transcontinental railroad and a whole bunch of different things. They would work under the table and make things really prosperous for a lot of the the richer individuals who would ultimately produce uh, a lot within the country. Ultimately, though, uh, Chester Arthur was really conflicted about it, for better and worse. He understood the reality of Chinese immigration, but at the same time, it was also, I don't want the you know, economy to fail because we're just stopping people from coming into the country. But at the same time, it it was a no-win situation regardless of what he chose. And especially at that particular time with all the pressure that he had on both sides of the political spectrum and both political parties, Chesley Arthur, after some battling, would ultimately sign in the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, with some uh, relative concessions. Instead of a 20-year ban, it would be a 10-year 10 10-year 10 ban, and the legislation um, themselves was written in a way that it wouldn't affect China, which I'll get to when I talk about. <coughs> excuse me, uh, Grover Cleveland, Teddy, and a whole bunch of other presidents uh, that are going to follow him, especially Woodrow Wilson. That's going to be a fan- fascinating episode. Uh, with China being the primordial goal, that's the big market of untapped resources, potential, and a lot of people that, you know, they don't want to ruin any chances that they have with that particular market. The Chinese exclusion bill will be signed in, and Chinese immigration will be restricted for the next 10 years in this country's history. So in the country, civil rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, for both Native Americans and blacks in the country uh, was a big issue as well. Um, Native Americans, the, the wars raging on in the Midwest and Midwest. Uh, this is around the particular time, though, that, you know, the Indians just couldn't fight back. They just couldn't. Um, the American army was just too powerful, too strong, and ultimately this is the beginning of a lot of reservations ultimately being created. That a lot of them really started and began under Chester E. Arthur and subsequent presidents. Um, a lot of them. Most of them that, that would be well-known uh, they're actually using movies uh, in basically the Dakota Territory. Arthur would sign an executive order late in his term uh, as the president, uh, creating that particular reservation, which would be known as the Crow Creek Reservation. Although, Grover Cleveland is a very complicated president and revoked that order, I think, once they found out that, oh, technically they do have title rights because of this one particular person back in, like, 1805. Uh, oh, okay, that I'm just going to revoke that and throw that in the trash real quick. <clears throat> And then civil rights reform. So they had the Civil Rights Acts and a whole bunch of different legislation to try and create equal rights within uh, the federal, at least federally legislated. But at the same time, you know, Congress, states' rights, Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. um, Things were becoming very tedious and tenuous within the South. Like I said, the Jim Crow South really starting to be bolstered by this particular point in time. Um... And, excuse me, and it's also very clear that things are changing for better and worse um, in the South in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the, the Southern Republican Party is uh, faltering in a lot of ways. A lot of black people felt disenfranchised by the Republicans, which is not helping uh, the Republican cause in any, in any way, shape, and form. That being said, uh, there was a new, well, well, relatively speaking, a new political establishment, I guess you could say, a new political party that was really growing around that particular point in time. They would be, it, I guess you could say it's like Republican Democrats. Um, uh, the, the, this new party was called the Readjusters. Um, they basically wanted, relatively speaking, equal rights for a whole bunch of different things, and for both blacks and white people, education, uh, patronage, everything you can think back, uh, think back about. 
and they're really good. They they work with independents, the Greenback Party, um, even some Black Republicans started going on to their side because you know there was some relative level of cooperation that would really occur there. <clears throat> and there was at the very least a, a relative slim hope that the South would, <clears throat> my goodness, um, would change course at the very least in terms of civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. But that would be basically just be gone by the time. Uh, Grover Cleveland really comes into the into office. That being said, there is a sliver of relative hope of real freedom and equality that is occurring in the South that should be very much noted. You know, Free State of Jones kind of thing going on. Now, I think we should talk about foreign policy because Arthur is probably one of the first presidents that really it, foreign policy is very imperative and important um, to his term and to the future of the country. You know, there's there's this myth. In my personal view, that the, that America wasn't isn't imperialistic or isn't an empire in any way, shape, and form. And truth be told, we've always been an empire, and we've always had some relative level of ambition uh, towards that goal. Um, we just had a lot of people in our country that didn't have that particular goal in mind, <coughs> or at the very least, explicitly advocated for it. You know, you know, we weren't always interventionists. I mean, for the love of God, Jefferson was advocating for destroying the pirates you know and all the and the the uh, during his term as president and excuse me even before that we've always been interventionists in a whole bunch of different ways we've always wanted to try and take over spanish america um for economic purposes um uh the book by william appleton williams which really helped change my perspective and really opened my mind um really points out just the idea of the interventionist policies that this country's always had and it really begins 100 percent full full bore with cuba and the latin american countries uh, around this particular point in time now chester a arthur in particular uh which by the way the book is um the the tragedy of american diplomacy i think you should read i hope i, I think i got the book right um <clears throat> it's, it's it's only like 350 pages but it's it shook me a little bit. Um, that and the contours of American history are really good, too. Um, for Arthur, a lot of things were really opening up by that particular point in time. Uh, two things were happening, at least in terms of foreign policy, that are very important. Uh, more countries are being open to trade. China, like I said before. Uh, Japan starting to become much more industrialized, and they're needing resources from the exterior. And it's going to begin this relationship with Japan that's going to uh, go up and down, and then eventually, you know, World War Two, obviously. Um... <clears throat> but ultimately, um, the big markets are trying to open up, and you know there's a lot of countries that have a lot of different products that America wants, that America wants to use for the resources, sugar plantations in South America, the Barbados areas, you know, tobacco, all that stuff that they can import, export, raw materials that they can use for a multitude of different purposes and different things. And this required, at the very least, some strength. You know, in a lot of ways, it's Teddy Roosevelt's idea of the big stick policy, you know, speak softly but carry a big stick. Um, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, it's, it's it starts here in in a lot of aspects, in a lot of ways. Not saying that Arthur was the the the, the, dun- the jump start of it, but the the ideas really start swarming around this particular point in time, and he really jump starts the idea of a reformed navy. He starts allocating a lot of the surplus in a lot of ways and a lot of money and tax revenue into fortifying uh the navy creating more gunships uh approving funds for a whole bunch of different things uh the the puritan the amphorite uh the terror uh the monitor ships effectively and a couple other different things uh, you know sending them out to different contracts etc so that people can build them america um but in a lot of ways, to really strengthen our resolve at the very least in foreign markets and overseas, because you know we've been basically, relatively speaking, in terms of relative comparison, less interventionist over the course of probably since like the War of eighteen twelve to now. Uh, we haven't done anything with our navy really for the most part. So it was very clear that the world's expanding. We need more um, foreign markets to really s- sufficiently grow our economy to an expedient amount in that you know maybe we can start shaping the world into the american way you know and it really starts here so he really focuses on that for for quite some time whether it was james james g plain started it and then his other secretary of state really pushed forward um that you know the frederick theodore freyler i can't pronounce his name 
he started doing a whole bunch of different treaties in Nicaragua. Um, in a lot of ways, he actually st- they, I think he he was actually specifically trying to start a treaty that would basically create like the pa- like the Nicaraguan Canal, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> With a stretch of land to cut the country in half for the big canal for trade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That really wouldn't get jump started until Teddy Roosevelt, obviously, and it wouldn't be in Nicaragua, it'd be in Panama. But um, a lot of different treaties in Santo Domingo, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and specifically Cuba um, really made things very interesting and very difficult. A lot of these treaties upset the Republican Party because it gave a lot more leeway to the other countries that, you know, they had a lot more power and strength in terms of how they wanted to legislate or now nah, we're not going to give you this wool for for this much they gave him a lot more bargaining power is ultimately what i'm trying to say and you know for arthur i think part of it was he didn't want to overreach it was really laissez-faire kind of just like eh, whatever you know and not really thinking about the future and also i just don't think he wanted to piss off anybody regardless of whether you're american or another different country but ultimately that's ultimately what really occurred foreign intervention really starts uh, building up during Arthur's presidency, including naval reform, and ultimately uh, certain treaties with certain countries for export-import duties that gave a lot more way towards, you know, the other countries having a lot more power, which uh, a lot of, you know, big businessmen, establishment people ultimately disliked for, you know, because they're establishment people. Those are generally the big things that specifically occur, the major aspects of Chester A. Arthur's presidency. Now, if I can give you a quick rundown of effectively how it kind of happened. Not necessarily a timeline, but just the trajectory of how things went up and down. So, when Arthur came into his, into the presidency, he was a relative unknown. A lot of people held that hope, but they were also resigned to the reality that nothing would probably get done. And... Um, Arthur himself was apprehensive to the reality that, oh God, I am president. Oh Jesus. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, like a little Morty like, if that makes any sense. If you're a big Rick and Morty fan. Um, that being said, I think once he really understood that he had that power, he wasn't going to be going away. He could have resigned, been, you know, made himself a historical president in that particular way, uh, being the first one to do so instead of Nixon. But it also. It became very clear that, you know, when he looked into it, it was the country who had a lot of problems. There was a lot of things that were going on, political machinations. And Arthur had a lot of responsibilities to jug, to juggle, a lot of different people to make happy, a lot of different people that he had to, to answer to, for better or worse. Um, you know, big business, uh, Republicans and Democrats, a whole bunch of different people. You know, it's a lot to be the president, to have a law on your plate, and you don't know who to really trust, ultimately. And I think Arthur didn't really trust a lot of particular people, which is why when he went into the presidency, he was like, I'm going to try and do my own thing. I don't want to be influenced in any meaningful way, shape, or form. Which is why in the early goings of his term, a lot of his cabinet, or Arthur's cabinet, or not Arthur's cabinet, like Garfield's cabinet ultimately ends up leaving some stay. Because um, I think they wanted to give him a chance to see what happens. In the early goings, he, ta- he does try to tackle a lot of different things, a lot of different issues. He starts with the country, excuse me, domestically speaking. I mean, the country hadn't ha- hasn't had a surplus in a long time. And... You know, both Republicans and Democrats are really trying to figure things out. And the people are trying to figure things out. You know, economically speaking, things were good and bad. And, you know, there's a real big disparity between classes, the rich and the poor. Immigration is a big issue. So he's trying to tackle things one at a time. And ultimately, he fails, succeeds, fails, succeeds. It's an up and down roller coaster with Chester E. Arthur. And everything that happens ultimately... um, has, I guess in a lot of ways, the people really liking him, adoring him in a lot of ways. They probably wouldn't re-elect him again, but they can't say in relative comparison that they are dissatisfied with the job that Chester A. Arthur has ultimately done. Is probably, I think, what a lot of people felt at at that particular time. I don't think a lot of people felt like he was a very strong president, very steadfast and very capable, but the very same end of the spectrum, you know... I think in terms of just the overall expectations, they were pleasantly surprised with how well he turned out to be. Now, over the course of his presidency, um, doing the appointments, et cetera, et cetera, trying to do civil service reform, foreign policy, really changing it um, to become, I don't want to say interventionalist, but there's a lot more workings in terms of trying to create more foreign markets. And there's a lot of different things that are going on that, you know, are really beginning under Arthur and more likely because of Congress ultimately. But 
uh, Arthur is the, the, the face of it. And I think in a lot of ways he actually kind of held back um, from a lot of things happening. Uh, for better, in my personal view. Really restricted a whole bunch of different things uh, to really kind of keep Congress and just the people and the Repu- and both specific uh, Democrat and Republican parties from basically just going full bore empire um, in many aspects. Now, that's not to say he didn't want an empire or anything like that. But, you know, I think even he was resigned and understood to the fact that, you know, it's a slippery slope, you know, if once we go in that direction. So with little, he it was just little things that he would help participate, facilitate, in, and really impeded a lot of different things and fast-tracked a lot of different things that would hurt both, uh, especially the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as well. Which is a big reason why uh, the Republicans and Democrats over time just just went lower and lower and lower in terms of the overall approval rating between uh, both political parties and political factions. Um, Stalwarts really didn't like him anymore, and um, I guess you could say the half-breeds really loved him, but also knew that he was a stalwart and wasn't probably going to vote him back in if given the opportunity. So he was being used in a lot of different ways, although the half-breeds would vote uh, for him and in, in his particular direction if anything that he produced for the most part and a lot of things are happening to Arthur in his personal life and just in the country as a whole um, things are getting better and things are getting worse um, you know for every good thing that happened it was a bad thing that happened for every bad thing that happened something good probably came out of it ultimately you know for all the problems of economic issues the country ultimately succeeded um Financially, in many different ways, we had a very strong economy until I think 1893, when the the, the next financial crisis occurs, and <clears throat> and ultimately, um, uh, what am I thinking? Sorry, my brain is not working right now. And you know, for all the problems in terms of civil rights issues, the country themselves really starting to turn this because this is the first generation uh, after the Civil War where things. Um, are changing you know it's it's a very very slow process but you know the democratic party ultimately in a lot of ways begins really taking ironically the um the forefront away from the republican party of civil rights uh it really doesn't start here but there you can see the grumblings that are really occurring so i just want to point that out as a very interesting tidbit in fact um arthur himself is not feeling too well uh, probably by I would say 1883 to 1884, Arthur um, is not looking too good. Physically, his health is deteriorating. He looks a lot older than he actually is. Um, and specifically, he's losing a lot of weight. He used to be a real pudgy guy, but you know, by the end of his presidency, he looks like he loses like 50 pounds. And people are kind of interested to why it's happening. So, specifically, what what's happening to him is... Well, okay, it's called nephritis. Uh, in your kidneys, you have these nephrons which help filter a whole bunch of different things out. And effectively, he just has really bad kidney diseases. He's not functioning really well. You know, if he had, you know, one of the... Oh, my God, my brain is not working right now. Um, it's the actual machine that filters out your blood. Um, dialysis. If you had, like, a dialysis machine, he probably lives. But there was no such thing, unfortunately, back then for uh, Chester A. Arthur. He had and he was basically in his mid fifties by the by the by the point he started feeling it. <coughs> and the elections coming up of eighteen eighty four, um, that I'll get to when I talk about Grover Cleveland and a whole bunch of different people. And for the two main reasons, ultimately his declining health, uh, but the other reason that he's just not popular. If he goes for a re-election bid, uh, Chester A. Arthur would not win. The likely candidate probably would have been his former Secretary of State, James G. Blaine, and he would probably lose if there was a Republican primary or a convention, ultimately, uh, that would occur. He would probably be an interesting compromise candidate. I think he probably, if he was healthier, would have run, but that was the nail in the coffin once his health started declining. Basically, by 1883, Chester A. Arthur was resigned to the reality that he would only serve one term as president, and Chester A. Arthur would not seek another term of office. As I stated before, um, he had the, the, the kidney disease. I think it was called Bright's disease at the time, and specifically, um, 
he, well, he found out about it, I think, in 1882, 1883, around that particular point in time. Um, it was eventually going to be a fatal disease, so I think he, which is the biggest reason why he was resigned to the reality, wasn't going to run for a second term. He wasn't opposed to having people, you know, go for him in the convention and stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But he also wasn't like, eh, definitely do it for me under the table. He really, I, I think, really didn't care. Um, it was around this time, too, that while he's doing all the things in the country, the health is really impairing him. He's traveling a little bit to go to warmer climates that might actually refresh him. Um, I think he goes to, like, Yellowstone Park at one point, and things are improving, at least for a little bit in 1883 and 1884. But he's also losing a lot of weight, and now it's really grossly starting to affect him. So 1884 comes around. The country's, you know, all over the place, specifically. But it's pretty, pretty stagnant. Um, in terms of, you know, events that occur, things that happen, and ultimately he just is riding the waves of really doing nothing. And people are just working, doing their thing, and, uh, Arthur's doing his thing too, at least with whatever he can. So he's doing the last minute things, um, some more civil service reform, some more civil rights reform, some more economic things, especially with the, the reformation and build up with the Navy, He's trying to push for a lot of those things uh, right before he leaves Congress, or not Congress, uh, the presidency, ultimately. 1884 comes around. Um, James G. Blaine, he's basically the leader of the Republican Party at this particular point. Um, Stalwarts are basically gone. Um, you can thank Chester A. Arthur, basically, for that. He's kind of like the last one in a lot of ways, but uh, the, the half-breeds really have um, a full you know, control of the Republican Party, which are pretty socially liberal, fiscally conservative, um, wing of the party ultimately is fully taken over. It's pretty cool. Um, excuse me. Republican National Convention comes around to James G. Blaine will win the nomination after four attempts, or four ballots technically, and Arthur would help to an extent, um, at the very least promoting James G. Blaine, um, in solidarity, you know, um, basically like, ah, congratulations, et cetera, et cetera, vote for this guy. Uh, but he wouldn't really do much after that. I think Blaine had some resentment towards Arthur for not really helping with the campaign, but dude's dying, basically, so what do you expect? Um, and once uh, Grover Cleveland will win the election of 1884, uh, he ends up leaving office in 1885 and comes back home to New York City in that beautiful brick house building. Um, damn, I forgot the actual address of it. I don't have it in front of me, and I can't think right now. Um, but he comes home. And really just tries to enjoy life as much as he possibly can. He ends up basically just vibing, chilling out for the most part. Um, tries to go fishing. Can't really do that because the disease, uh, Bright's disease, had actually taken some issues with his heart. Um, he's basically just perpetually sick the entire time, unfortunately. Um, which really hurt him. He loved fishing and couldn't fish, which is just unfortunate. Um, he tried to go back to work, but uh, go back to law practice, to his law practice, but ultimately it was very difficult. Physically was incapable of doing so. So he's basically just stuck at home uh, in the early goings of 1885 and really couldn't do much except just wither away, unfortunately. Um, a couple months after his presidency, um, a couple of people, specifically the, the New York uh, branch of the Star Wars, which were still, uh, in a lot of ways, the Conkling uh, branch of the party, they asked him to try and run for the Senate, but he declined. He couldn't do it. He physically could not physically do it. Um, and ultimately, he tries to go back to work. He basically just is just an advisor to whatever law practice he was. I think it was uh, Arthur Neves and Ransom. And really stayed out of the limelight uh, for the most part. Doesn't really do much after that. He, for the last two, like, couple years of his life, because he dies very young, um, one of the shortest post-presidencies of, of, of our country's history. He spends some summers in Connecticut, uh, goes into basically just trying to enjoy life as much as he can. Um, and on uh, November 16th, uh, or basically November 16th, or he falls because of a cerebral hemorrhage ultimately and never regains consciousness uh, he dies a couple of days later on november 18th at the age of 57 years old chester arthur our 21st president of the united states of america uh, ends up getting buried in new york city uh, a couple of days later with his family there how do you define chester a arthur how do you define his presidency how do you define everything in a retrospective perspective and look 
That's a very good question. It's very difficult to really assess certain people sometimes, and you know, corruption, et cetera, et cetera, is corruption, and people are complicated. But I think if trust that your Arthur's presidency really shows anything, it just shows that you know nothing's perfect. Nothing is ever as seamless as you want it to be. Nothing is ever really anything um, that looks and is, and is cut out to be. Um, How do I, I, I really can't explain it. So let me go through my, my thought process, you know. Information, trying to find, you know, facts, et cetera, et cetera. It's always uh, very complicated, especially in history and, sp- and specifically post-Civil War era. Um, United States, there's a lot of, I don't even want to say dif- disinformation, but, you know, I, I always find it interesting that a lot of books, a lot of, you know, biographies tend to paint a lot of these billionaires and you know, positive lights, et cetera, et cetera, when, you know, they really had a lot of control over the country, and, you know, I always think it's really interesting. Same thing, same exact thing with certain politicians. You know, a lot of people hold up these people and all the presidents as really just obscure people that really didn't do much, for better or worse. Um, but in a lot of ways, you know, you could argue they did a lot of worse for the country and showed how deep corruption could potentially go, um, whether it be Hayes, Grant, Arthur, uh, um, Garfield, even, you know, Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, I think it's really interesting to, to try and scour as much detail as you possibly can, you know, and, you know, the, every single day that I do more research and every single day that I look into more of these people, the more I find conflicting data of everything, um, that this person did this, but then there's this source that says that. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is with Chester A. Arthur, um, just like a lot of these presidents post grant i guess in a lot of ways it's very difficult to try and figure out you know the truth from fiction sometimes and you know if you had to look at arthur objectively you see him as a guy who in earnest really was not a very strong person emotionally um in a lot of ways i think was very em- empathetic um very considerate of a lot of different people a lot of different perspectives um enjoyed the finer things in life and ultimately you know lived his life in that particular way even if it meant being a little corrupt and you know around thing uh or just you know around certain issues and things and you know i think he in a lot of ways wanted what was best for the country if not for the fear of upsetting the populace and the people you know and you know i think it's just just really interesting because like a lot of these presidents especially post grant and all of them you know you you go back and forth between how you feel about them the perspectives and how you feel about them you know I, my perspective of Hayes changes every single day you know and same with arthur because one day i'll be thinking to myself you know for everything that was put up against him when you look at the amalgamation of you know this guy never specifically i think um aside from being the vice president really held elected public office before until he was the vice president and then basically gets thrusted into a position that he didn't want or was very ill prepared for and i think was put in an even more position where he didn't have a lot of power have a lot of sway and ultimately had to do what the democrats wanted or you know just what the people wanted um going against his own personal bias etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know i i think it's interesting because i think i i think you have to praise people like that to a certain degree and to a certain extent um but it's also undeniable too that you know there's something about arthur that the levels of little things that he could probably potentially get away with i think has to be noted as well and really just you know put a bit of a damper on something that you know he really could have had a fantastic and fascinating uh history ultimately and he, it's interesting because on one hand he he's one of those guys that um once he left office i think the people liked him but then um especially with subsequent presidents um you know history looked at him a little bit more down in comparison because it's like well he didn't do anything you know at the very least grover cleveland's grover cleveland harrison's the billion dollar guy um and william mckinley was one of the more popular presidents until teddy came around you know so he goes into obscurity and i think a lot of people post presidency tend to look down on chester a arthur and his overall reputation and his overall uh legacy i guess um i don't think he was a bad president i think he was a a human being who chose before his own term as the president um you know some levels of corruption to satisfy his own personal wants um 
I think in a lot of instances he did try to be a good person, but you know, he's just like, yeah, if I can get away with this, I'll get away with it. You know, I think a lot of us would do the exact same thing. Let's just be honest. You know, it's kind of like if you're, if you work at like a fast food restaurant, it's like, if I'm, I'm going to just take a large fry, it's not, not like it matters, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of situations, if that makes any sense, uh, to anybody. Arthur, though, was one of those guys, though, I'm very curious if he didn't have Bright's disease, what his historical legacy would have turned out. I'm not saying he would have won, um, but I think there's a hypothetical and potential argument that, you know, he compromised a lot more than I think people realized, and, you know, there's a possibility that he could have been the Republican nominee, maybe ran and won and got a second term, or maybe would have ran again, you know, later on after after Cleveland's first term. Who knows? Maybe he prob- Benjamin Harrison probably won't be the nominee, or Blaine probably wouldn't have been the nominee. Who knows? And I'm very curious to see what his legacy would have looked like, um, because right now it's clouded. And, you know, there are certain presidents that have second terms, and it's definitive in a lot of ways, um, their overall legacy of who they are. You know, you can argue certain presidents had uh, an, an indisputably good legacy or indisputably bad legacy depending on how their second term goes out you know it's like if obama had just one term he'd probably been like a what if but now that we know what it is it's like oh that's that's not good you know and same exact thing with like george w bush where it's like oh, they got one term but then it's like oh that's, <laughs> that's not good either you know and i think it's it, it's it's one of those particular situations where and again i don't like to play in what ifs i really don't um, although I keep saying that a lot and I keep thinking about what is so call me a hypocrite it's okay Arthur though he's always going to be in a bit of an enigma to me just like uh, I mean Garfield not, that's what's interesting out of all of these you know post reconstruction presidents and pre I guess you could say 20th century presidents um, he's probably the most conflicting because i don't know how i feel about him i think i have a pretty you i think i have a pretty square id on like rutherford b hayes and i think garfield's pretty clear once you look at all the little things that he does but for for arthur it's just little bits and pieces of relative corruption to him actually like trying to work with the people and congress to try and get things done to help facilitate a better country so i think it's really interesting to to look at it in that view because it leaves me really just needing more information before I can personally make my own biased ideological opinion of Chester A. Arthur because right now I can't so he's kind of like an incomplete to me he's the enigma you know I know who he is but at the same time you know there are actions that he does that conflict with the things that he objectively uh, believes in or and or does and it's really conflicting you know because the truth is, is that I've come to realize after looking at history is that, you know, if, if there's actual corruption, corruption, or there's actual problems, problems, like, you know, if people do real shady things, they're probably pretty shady and vice versa. You know, they, they don't do these things. More often than not, they're probably not that bad. But, you know, if you can find one or two things, it's like, oh, excuse me. No, that's not a good characteristic of you because it's probably indicative of you being not a very honorable individual person, you know like the Republican Party in the in, in the 2000s and the Democratic Party in the 2010s and well, today. Um, you know what I'm saying. Um, ultimately, and that's just how I see it and that's just how I look at it. And for, for Arthur, he does one thing that's corrupt and then he also does a lot of things and really abdicates a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, point being, like when he was doing his whole commission for the, the Pendleton Act, it's like he has every reason to to not do it but the fact that he expedited it ensure that it passed through congress is also very confusing because it could potentially expose him to a whole bunch of different things which also goes to show that and that was a bipartisan thing so democrats had every incentive to to get him out of there unless it was one of those situations specifically where it was uh we'll keep him there because you know he's doing a lot of good things that we want specifically so you know politics but who knows um you know, if it was like modern politics today and anyone tried to do that, you know, like, for instance, modern interpretation of politics to 2020, 
you know, if the Republicans try to do anything like that, or, you know, the Democrats would be like, oh, blah, 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 do everything they possibly could to stop it, you know, or vice versa, you know, it, because it, it's politics, and you know how it goes. Um, Arthur, though, it, he's just confusing. So my final thoughts. Arthur is one president that I... If I was going to choose to write a biography, a biography about, he'd probably be in my top five, if I'm going to be honest with you. He's fascinating. He's an enigma. I mean, if I had to make my list of presidents, I think Reagan would probably be up there, because he himself is incredibly fascinating. I think FDR is up there. I think Wilson's up there, for various different reasons, uh, other than Reagan. I think Washington's very, very interesting. I think William McKinley is very interesting. Um, I, and I think Arthur would probably be up there, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, the more you look at Arthur, the more a picture gets muddled. You know, and the only way you could really look at it is through the various little things that he would do in his everyday life. He's a very clean person, very much about his own physical appearance, probably because he was a little pudgy. You know, probably didn't really think of himself that much and had a fantastic mustache, which... I probably should have talked more about because that thing is fire. If you ever get to see a picture of him, if you see this video, just my lord, look at that! Look at that mustache! Come on, fam, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, the only way you can really, uh, at least in my view, look at how people act, react, and go about their everyday lives. You know, it's in in a more interpersonal setting. I think you get a much better picture of them ultimately and and much more interesting and much more emotionally tying and i think much more honest interpretation of the individual and person and and for arthur it's just it's confusing it's very very fascinating though so i can give my final thoughts on chester a arthur a complicated president with good bad and ultimately did a lot more than I think people realize and also was someone that I'm I ponder and think you know what if one of the very few times that I will adamantly say what if because ultimately it's not a a what if of what he could have been but it's a it's a what if in the sense of who he actually is if he had another couple years I think I might be able to figure I might have been able to figure out really who he is and the overall context of his own life, his own legacy, and ultimately just who Chester A. Arthur, the handlebar mustache man, ultimately is. Ooh, thank you guys for listening. If you like it, listen. If you don't, eat biscuits. Have a great day, guys.